Okay, thank you all for coming to this session. Um, just as the last few people find their seats, um, so we don't get too behind again. Uh, my name is Catherine Newell. I'm one of the students on the Smart Institute team. Uh, we have two talks on intersectionality, and then we're going to take questions for both of the talks at the end. Um, if you have, if you think of questions during the talks, do put them on the Slido website um, or app or you can ask questions at the end. And for Mike, so our first talk is from Alain Leville, Charlotte Field and Lucy Hart from the University of Reading. Excellent. So we're going to split our talk uh, across three of us. Um, this really was a partnership, so the three of us will be delivering separate parts individually. I'm Alain, I'm a lecturer in clinical psychology at the University of Reading and I'm also the incoming Dean for Diversity and Inclusion. So as a university, we're doing a lot looking at student experience for BAME students. I've put in funding for three separate projects to support and understand experiences of students with a disability, particularly students who have no, you know, neurodiversity considerations. But today we'll be very much focusing on a study that we did over summer, looking at LGBT plus <coughs> few, uh, students' experiences of the University of Reading. I'm gonna hand over, step aside and hand over to Charlotte and Lucy, can you Well, uh, hi, I'm Charlotte. I'm a third year MSI clinical psychology student at the University of Reading, and I am currently training in cognitive behavior therapy. And I'm here today because I was very fortunate to win a competitive internship on the undergraduate, undergraduate research opportunities program. I'm Lucy Hart. I do my clinical training at the University of Reading. So I'm a qualified psychological wellbeing practitioner. Uh, so that basically means I work with common mental health um, at a low intensity CBT level. Um, and I'm also a research assistant in clinical psychology um, for the University of Reading. So over to Charlotte, who's going to give me the introduction. So it can't be understated that the LGBT plus community has made significant strides in recent years, such as the legislation of same-sex marriage in March 2014, as well as the approval of teaching LGBT plus relationships in schools, and also the popularity of gay pride and pride month across the world. However, despite this, you could argue there are still facts that need to be addressed. So for example, Gender dysphoria is a clinical diagnosis in the DSM-5, which is a diagnostic manual used within the mental health fields. And this revolves around, this revolves around a discomfort or distress between, between biological sex and gender identity. And this can be perhaps considered harmful as it may be saying that transgender identity is pathological. And of course there is there is um, discrimination still exists in various forms, such as homophobia, transphobia, or biphobia among the general and student populations. <coughs> so, Mayer's research suggests that there is a high prevalence of mental health disorders amongst LGBT plus individuals compared to heterosexual <laughs> students. And this can be traced back to the potential stigmatisation that individuals may experience. So, for example, lack of self-acceptance or, or alienation. And then this can manifest itself in minority stress. <coughs> so then this can present itself as, the, so for example, depression, substance abuse or suicide ideation. And also other external factors may have a knock-on effect. So for example, Callahan found that in relation to religion, it may, it may impact discrimination, therefore have a direct impact on well-being. Also, Misawa found in the case of sexual minorities of colour, both, both discrimination and conflict were experienced on a much higher level as well as racism and homophobia were both found to have impact within their own communities as well as within the LGBT plus community itself. So this may, up, this may bring up potential divides within the LGBT plus community itself, and as well as also highlighting the need for inclusivity, sensitivity and awareness in this as well. So 
So, as indicated previously, there can be perhaps some serious implications for some for LGBT plus individuals in terms of discrimination. And this is further exemplified by John Sinatel, who found that there was a widespread relationship between mental health, suicide ideation, suicide, sexual orientation, as well as identity. And also he highlighted that there are certain risk factors that need to be addressed, for example, peer rejection, as well as gender discrimination in the case of transgender students. So moving on to now consider Pointer and Tubbs research. So in light of what we've just discussed, the safe spaces that he very much found within the research it can be even considered even more important. And the creation of these has suggested the coming together of students and staff as allies as well as members of the LGBT plus community to create a more inclusive and embracive climate within a campus community. However, it may also be of importance to address specific groups within the LGBT plus community as Beeman highlighted in their research into transgender students. And so they basically found that a lack of basic knowledge could serve to further, to further marginalise these individuals. So for example, common beliefs about, about sexual orientation and gender identity and maybe lack of education may contribute to this as well as gender segregation in toilets. And so there are several key initiatives that, that Beeman suggested. So in terms, in terms of this, developing administri administrative practices that are trans-inclusive, as well as um, building up all that education about gender diversity. And this very much feeds into the role that identity language plays that Dawson found in the development of social identity. So moving on to the next slides. So Windermere et al. did directly address higher education and the fact of retention and graduation and found that simply being a member of the LGBT plus community could have a negative impact on retention and graduation if basic needs are not met for these individuals. And this is in comparison to the majority of students at university. And certainly campus-wide studies give us a better idea of specific issues that may be experienced on campus. And in relation to, in relation to Ellis's cli campus climate survey, they found that homophobia is still very much a prevalent thing on campus. However, they did also found that this was mainly propagated by other students rather than the university itself. And certainly, Ren points out that there are potential pitfalls with research such as climate studies due to the methods of data collection used. So, as it is clear from, from the aim of our current research is to try and address these pitfalls. And as it is clear from previous research within this area, the experiences of LGBT plus individuals in higher education can vary substantially from person to person as well as what external factors can have an impact. And so as you can see here, in combining previous research on this subject, there are several factors that perhaps need to be considered when conducting research into this area. And so such as academic performance, risky behavior, and mental health. So to build on the research, such as the climate studies that happened previously, what our research today focuses on is the mainly the thoughts and experiences of the students at the University of Reading. And with very much of the aim to answer the question, do LGBT students feel supported and are able to be their true selves while studying at the University of Reading? So recruitment for our study mainly took place through referral and snowboarding. And as you can see from our table presented here, we were able to recruit a good number and spread of LGBT plus indi ind individuals to take place in our, in our in-depth interviews. So on the next slide, we do have, these are a list of the five questions that we used during our interviews with the, and these are designed to be non-leading and open-ended and were very much based on previous research into the area to try and address 
maybe things that weren't addressed before and address what was also unique of the university of learning. So moving on, so, so information such as the purpose of storage and right to withdraw was covered prior to the interview. And the interviews were conducted either face to face or over telephone due to the fact that it happened over summer. There was perhaps an issue with maybe getting some news because they were home for holidays. We found that telephone interviews were quite helpful in that respect and being more convenient. And prior to the interview, we did collect some demographics, so such as gender identity and sexual orientation, as well as year of study. And during the interview, the interviews very much progressed from the questions that we showed you today, gathering more information of the experiences and the situation around LGBT plus students um, at the university. So in relation to the standard ethical considerations were applied in this research in addition to a favourable approval from the School of Psychology as well as the CSL Research Ethics Committee at the University of Reading. Informed consent and data protection procedures were followed, as well as we, were, we also very much considered the sensitive nature of the information disclosed in the interview as potentially there may have been some distressing content from some of the students involved. Okay, so in terms of the results, we identified that there was four overarching themes, which were LGBT plus personal reflections, us versus M mentality, LGBT plus society, and visibility of LGBT plus community at the university. And as you can see, we additionally had some sub-themes that fell within. So I'll just give you a moment to have a look over those. And then I'd like to just move on and discuss about the overarching themes and a couple of the sub-themes. So, in terms of the LGBT plus personal reflections, now it was crucial for us really to get um, a reflection of what the students are experiencing, as that was one of our aims. So um, we noticed that these personal accounts of the individual were lucrative in terms of information that they gained, particularly from their personal perspective. So this quote here is taken from the perspective sub theme. Um, as well as getting good grades, you want to feel like you actually belong here. So, we noted that the goal of the university was to get the degree, but it's quite important for us to consider that this is only part of the bigger picture. Being at the university actually looks at additional um, life skills, such as socialising, building that community, and that sense of belonging. So, it's of great importance, really, just um, to consider that in terms of the student experience and in the something that the university should consider as a whole. And then we come on to the us versus them mentality. So we noted throughout the data that there was a recurring theme of social, social segregation, whether it be through the LGBT plus students and um, students who identified as heterosexual. But this also extended to the LGBT plus students and actual academic um, educators and staff which was kind of controversial. So this quote um, draws upon that, and it's taken the theme of overemphasis of LGBT plus community. I almost actually feel like, you know, um, now that people from other communities are sort of being pushed further away, like being straight is not as cool as being gay or that kind of thing. So despite the increased implementation of inclusive activities, students felt um, quite glamorised and it's really important to draw on the fact that the student said pushed further away so it identifies that there is that feeling of marginalisation that idea of social segregation and also drawing further on that pre-existing division between the student population which is something that is really needs to be considered the third sub theme which is LGBT plus society so this actually considered the society on campus, the student representatives. The idea that these um, societies are available as a form of community, not only of it being um, in physical person, but also social media. So the idea of having this society, um, the data demonstrated to us that it was at a high level of inclusion and therefore more positive impact in the student experience. Um, from this quote we can see 
It's not. It's just scary in general because it's a new environment. But you do also have that added factor of well, I don't know if I'm going to find out, find any other LGBT people there, get along more with LGBT people. It's again a case of more promotion into the societal aspect. So from this quote, we can acknowledge that it's very daunting as a student going to university for the first time, all those different social changes. But we can see from student one that there's more attention drawn to the fact that perhaps LGBT plus students may be experiencing additional sense of anxiety, which is something that the university must consider. And it's clear that um, the society is crucial, what well, is crucial function really is not only to provide that superficial sense of inclusion and diversity, but it's also there for the support, so providing that social construct and that social network. So the LGBT plus has the positive in that respect, but also we must consider in the data it was starting to show that there was that negativity as the society did have elements of um, being very close-knit and sometimes it would cause a segregation within the society itself. Moving on to the fourth sub-theme is visibility of LGBT plus community at the university. So um, it was clear in the data that the students were acknowledging the proactive, thank you, the proactive stance that the university was trying to make. So at the university um, where this project was conducted, at the University of Reading, um, that we have visual aids which identify um, LGBT plus allies and this may be in the form of postcards or lanyards which have the LGBT plus flag on them. So the students were very much aware of that and um, discussed that. And this quote was taken from the Place of Safety sub-theme. Um, so of course in that respect the university feels like a safe space and I think they have done everything they can to make you feel that. Obviously you'll get the odd minority that don't necessarily agree with you and make their feelings known but there is not much of the university can really do about that or what happens in town. So it's really quite pinnacle for us to pick up on this. The idea that the university had that sense of belonging, that place where the individual felt they could reveal their true self and be their true self, which contributed to the overall student experience, whether it be a positive, positive one, even though we do acknowledge that there's still elements of discrimination um, right within some universities. So moving on to the three key discussion points that we identified from the results was support. So even though the Equality Act um, in 2010 brought in the idea that LGBT plus students should have um, equality through facilities and services, um, the data actually show that there's some discrepancy between whether there was support services available or not. And this was really unclear um, whether the university was providing adequate support. So the two main points to take away from that is, really, the students don't feel like there is support, which may impact on their experience. And secondly, the inconsistency with the two extremes of, yes, there is loads of support and there's not enough, requires further investigation because there's clearly something missing. We also picked upon the staff training element. There was quite a lot of um, information provided in the data that um, students were requesting for staff to have specific training and um, potentially looking around the evolution of the LGBT plus community. So that will then allow um, faculty members to have more of an awareness of the spectrum of students on campus and also the diversity in sexual, um, sexuality and gender identity in hope of actually relieving any uncertainty or any kind of um, discrepancy around offensive language that may be used against students. And it was discussed that there should be a mandatory um, form of training. And finally, staff and student partnerships. So it is clear that the students are recognising staff are trying to um, promote awareness of the LGBT plus um, student members on campus. And that also instills an element of hope for the future that through projects such as this, we can look at building upon um, the staff and student relationship to bring that bridge together to prevent that was versus them mentality. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> so just to summarise all of those key points, looking at the discussion and the recommendations, uh, specifically for the University of Reading, but I guess more broadly as well across higher education, which maps on to 
my mental thinking. <coughs> the current evidence base, but looking for support for students both internally and the awareness and visibility of those support structures. So we have a really good welfare team at the university, but there's nothing in their list of topics that mention sexual orientation or gender identity. Quite a few of them have gone on Stonewall Allied training, and they're actually going to start up with an LGBTQ plus um, specialist within the welfare team. So making students aware that that provision is there. If you go on to any other website, or any of the documents about the welfare team, you wouldn't be able to find that. We found from our research last year that there's some difficulties with, if I do decide to go for help, which is a massive thing to do in itself, I fear that if I, the people I see won't understand my sexual orientation or my gender identity, so what's the point? So that ties very much to visibility and awareness, and also where to go to help in terms of external organisations. So we've put together a resource program that covers both LGBT uh, Q plus, as well as then also looking at gender identity, because considerations for gender identity can be quite different from sexual orientation. Staff training, we do trans awareness training three times a year. A lot of students that identify as trans that I've spoken to in the student body have said that there needs to be more, uh, more training for staff and making that more accessible. So we have a brilliant facilitator who does it three times a year, but maybe looking at an e-learning module like we have for our first inclusion module, I think that would have a wider access, um, and also people that are better in online working and group working, and that's more accessible. We also do allied training at the university. But going on to student staff partnerships, I think this is something that there's a lot of uh, eyes on in higher education. In my view, it's tied very much to student values and student community and sense of belonging. We look at all of that across the student body, but also specifically when we're considering diversity and inclusion. And some brilliant ideas came up from the data around there's a lot of events happening for staff or for students, but separate, or their uh, talks are quite research heavy. But how about the student staff partnership looking at LGBT plus history and having student contributors and staff contributors to that? And also a lot of our data found that students were saying we don't just want the cliche inverted commas, drag nights are getting drunk, we would also quite appreciate educational events as well. So those are key three points. And when we have questions later, which is after Dom's talk, we can think about um, the main things that come from that if any of you have questions. Thank you very much. Thank you and hello, how's everyone doing? I know we're in the free lunch slump now, so bear with me. Um, hi, hello, I'm Dom Smithies from Student Minds. Um, just for my benefit, how many people um, have heard of Student Minds before? Hopefully this is a familiar audience, okay, good. How many people have um, engaged in any areas of our work, our training, heard someone speak or anything like that? Um, Cool, okay, that means I've got new people in the audience that haven't engaged with us before. Hello and welcome, it's great to be engaging with you. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, intersectionality within student mental health. So my role at Student Minds, I've been on the team for about two and a half years now, and um, I lead on health inequalities, which means trying to understand different experiences of different student groups, and actually in the future actually trying to do some work to start to tackle those inequalities. Um, just to so give everyone a bit of some shared language, I have many conversations with many people across the sector about intersectionality and what it even means. It's a confusing term, but what we use is talking about the interconnected nature of different social categorizations um, and kind of how they apply to any individual or group um, and how that relates to discrimination or disadvantage. Is everyone roughly comfortable with that? Um, and then the joy of my job is I get to add um, not just mental health and well-being on top of all of those different social categorizations that um, may have been reluctant discrimination and disadvantage, but also as on another circle, actually looking at students in higher education specifically. So it's quite a niche that I get to focus on. Uh, I get told off to say the word niche because it makes it sound unimportant. It isn't. It's very important that we're carving out a really specific um, understanding within the sector and looking at different student groups who have experiences in mental health and looking at higher education specifically. I think it's really cool that you're all here, so I'm assuming you all agree. Um, so what we're going to be talking about today, um, I'm going to have to ask you all to bear with me, this is a 
first time I've kind of given a, an overrun of all of our work around health inequalities in one go. Um, so I'm going to be cutting out a lot of the methodology and sample size and such, and I know quite a lot of your research focus and probably want to know about that, so um, feel free to ask me questions about it and I can go into more detail later, or do check out any of our reports that are online and I'll happily talk through any of the research questions. So I'm going to be running through kind of a historical um, account of what we've done. So we did a piece of work on LGBTQ student mental health, which was um, probably our first and our biggest piece of work focusing on a particular demographic thus far. Um, we've done a lot of scoping work to inform my own understanding of various different health inequalities um, of different student groups. So I'll run through just some key headline findings from all of those groups um, just to kind of share with you all. Um, we've been doing a piece of work around men's mental health, we're um, just into the second year of the three year programme of that, so we're talking about that. Um, and also giving you a bit of an overview of some work we've done with the um, University uh, Mental Health Charter. So the data we captured from that, we did a piece of health and qualities research, um, which we haven't published yet. So I'll give you a bit of, of an overview of that, and all the first ones to hear about it. So um, and then also at the end, just wrap up. Um, set up kind of our ambitions for where we want to go in the future in this space. Um, so just to get everyone's mind thinking about some um, fun thoughts and challenges of questions I'm constantly navigating and um, discussing with people in the public sector. Um, the first being the role of having targeted interventions for particular student groups and our challenge of do we need those targeted interventions or is it just indicating the need that our current support provision isn't as inclusive or accessible as it could be? Um, do we need both? Probably. Um, what role do universities and student unions have to play in tackling health inequalities and supporting minority and marginalised communities at university? Um, and then the third question, which I've already given you an answer to, sorry. Um, can universities have a whole university approach without taking a whole population approach to their support offer? Um, I don't think they can, so my supplementary question to that is how can we actually meet the challenges and demands of our diverse student populations if we don't have the data to actually understand what those populations are and what they need? Um, I think that's been a recurring thing we've already picked up from listening to Nicola earlier in a few sessions earlier on. Um, if universities are capturing that demographic data, that has massive implications for research um, and for support provision as well. So, um, yeah, big job. So what have we done so far? So to kick things off with our piece of work around LGBTQ students, it is available on our website if you want to check it out. Um, the first big question, how many of us are there in, the, in higher education? Um, I'm afraid to say I don't have an absolute answer for you. Um, it's a complicated one to try and navigate. Uh, similar to Nicola, I've got some rough estimations of populations that could be between with um, you guys would like to kick off at the bottom, did a piece of work, work a year ago using the Kinsey scale to um, try and get a sense of how many people identified within the LGBTQ population. So that's a scale where people um, rank themselves from one to six and whether they're completely heterosexual to completely um, homosexual. Um, and around half of respondents didn't put themselves as, I always get it the wrong way around, didn't mark themselves as exclusively heterosexual. So you could say about half of people are LGBT. The most recent piece of work actually found about 20% of people are more specifically on um, being willing to adopt LGBTQ identities. But the Office of National Statistics is, um, I suppose, a lot, a lot smaller with their numbers, around 2% of the general population, and that increases with 4 to 25s. Um, but that's an indication of changing social attitudes, comfort and disclosing to um, institutions we don't know. Um, but Advanced HE, which is um, probably my favourite data to use, um, captures data from universities on a range of demographics. Um, institutions aren't currently mandated to capture data on LGBTQ students within their population, so um, the one and a half million is actually um, only of institutions who are capturing that data and also of the students in those institutions who um, click something that wasn't fair not to say. So of that population, um, as you can see, we've got uh, about 92 and a half identifying as heterosexual, which means that about seven and a half um, identifying as somewhere, <coughs> something other than, um, so kind of putting them in the LGBTQ umbrella. And that's been increasing year on year in their reports, so a growing population, 
Um, just to caveat what I'm about to talk about and um, a lot of LGBTQ research that's been done recently, takings off, um, take all of what I'm about to say with a pinch of salt, this slide's basically explaining. Um, it's obviously research is quite limited and because of a range of reasons, but prior to 1973, particularly challenges with um, social attitudes and legislation and how LGBTQ identities were captured under mental health conditions and uh, pathologising mixed identities. It, it complicates a lot of research and, and a lot of biases and found in research existed prior to that. Um, and then the second one, which I find really interesting, that people who are willing to engage in um, research who are open about their LGBTQ identity and or their mental health, just by being open about it, they're probably more likely to be comfortable with it um, and thus have better mental health, potentially. So people who are already engaging in this research potentially having more positive responses than those who are struggling with the stigma of either identity. So um, even though a lot of research that comes out on LGBTQ populations is already quite stark, I think that's probably a more positive reflection than is actually the reality. So um, please take that into consideration. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail because I think it's brilliantly covered previously, but um, what we already know, um, their experiences differ significantly from their non-LGBTQ counterparts. Uh, there's a high prevalence of poor mental health and low well-being. LGBTQ individuals are at high risk of developing mental health disorders, having lower self-esteem, um, body confidence, suicidal, suicidal ideation, substance abuse, and struggling with loneliness and self-harm. Uh, predictors of, of all that um, include being a victim of homophobia, biophobia, and transphobia, having to navigate a society and environment where there are norms which they are going against, and um, having to manage their sexual orientation and gender identity and choosing who to and when they disclose that information um, for their own safety. Being unable to talk to other people, and then of course, on top of that, as with all groups, um, there's factors of other things going on in their life, being a victim of bullying, abuse, or shame. Um, and just another thing to flag, uh, currently the average age of coming out, so it's going to be an open view of is 18, which is obviously an overlap with um, the transition point of people coming to university, so it's a significant focus, I think the sector needs to be um, mindful of um, this group. So just to touch upon some key findings for you, um, we were looking at in the research um, experiences of peer support, perceptions of the university's support offer, um, the LGBTQ community both within the university and in um, their locale, so where they're based. Um, kind of one of our first main findings is most students are more willing and comfortable engaging in the university LGBT community than in their local LGBT community. Um, and for many, it's actually a stepping stone. So most people who were engaged in the wider local community had previously got engaged in the, in the university community first. So it's a good kind of transition point for people who are coming to terms with their identity of getting people more comfortable with people in their age group, kind of in a similar experience to them before they go into kind of embracing the wider community and um, where they go to be based beyond university. Um, and then a few kind of uh, highlights on LGBTQ students and had about 500 respondents um, to our survey who identified as LGBT and as having mental health difficulties. Um, a lot of LGBT respondents um, felt there was a need for more support that the current provision was, was lacking, wasn't sufficient. Um, and particularly in our case support, they, there was a perception that they thought it would be beneficial and that they would have engaged with such a program had it existed. Uh, a few other things that we picked up, so we asked a lot about help seeking, we asked who they seek help from and what their experiences were with that and got them to rate them on the scale. Um, potentially unsurprising, um, friends or peers was uh, the source of support students were most comfortable um, in accessing the help or advice from, that's who they go to most. And they also had the most positive experiences from these groups of people as well, so there's there's a role to play in making sure peers are equipped to be supporting um, each other with their mental health, with their identity. Um, so they play a key role in doing this. People like to engage them, like to talk to them um, primarily. Um, parents were third on the list of um, who they are most likely to seek help from. Um, so peers was quite high at the top and then support services and parents um, were a bit of a drop, but were second and third. 
and the parents, uh, when it came to their experience, they were actually at the bottom of the list of how helpful they were. Um, not because that's kind of a common trend across all groups, but the variance between the students was quite significant. So, um, lots of students do have positive and helpful experiences in talking to their parents about mental health or their LGBTQ identity, but quite a few people also have really negative or unhelpful experiences with their parents. So, I'm really glad that there's still a lot to be played with talking to parents as supporters and in supporting young people with their mental health. Um, experiences of receiving support from counsellors, generally positive, but again, a bit of variance. Um, and then just to flag, students in lower year groups were uh, less likely to seek help from um, more sources of support, um, potentially due to lack of awareness of the support that's on offer or potentially less of need. And then to highlight just two groups within the LGBTQ population, trans and bisexual respondents uh, were more likely to seek help from a large number of sources. So this could indicate potentially that they generally need more support or that when they first reach out for support, they're not getting the help they need. Uh, some recommendations that we pulled from our market to go into this detail and um, we're talking about to improve cultural competence in support provision across the NHS and across universities. Um, the role of student unions and societies to actually be more inclusive. Quite a lot came through in how unhelpful and negative experiences were within societies. Um, happy to talk about that later. Um, and yeah, developing some more programmes that are targeted towards the now, I'm going to do a bit of a lightning round of lots of highlights of other groups, so bear with me because I've not done this before and it's going to be very light touch. Um, so, International Student Mental Health, uh, what we've done so far, we've worked with a group of student researchers to um, do a literature review and also to do a few focus groups of students at that institution. Um, we have a report, it's not published, I'm sorry. Uh, hopefully, it will be in the future, but just some factors that impact International Student Mental Health. Flag with you, our challenge around language barriers. Um, adjusting to a new culture and environment, um, unrealistic expectations when going into UK higher education, uh, the challenge of difficulties arising at home when they are studying um, in the UK, and the inability to have the time or money to be able to kind of commute to support where they need to be studying. Different levels of mental health literacy and stigma and different health seeking behaviours, and this is probably going to be a trend throughout lots of different health inequalities. And then a few additional stresses that we picked up was. Uh, challenges in adjusting to a different education system and um, the worries about what they do after their experience and um, after their time in the actual students over and the pressure and um, potentially given increased fees and um, the fact they have gone abroad for their education to be making the most of that time. Uh, Bain students, we did a light literature review a few years ago. Um, we're supporting someone doing a PhD. Do you want to give a wave? Um, some factors that we pulled out. Um, so, experiences of racism and discrimination is a huge risk factor for developing um, mental health. Uh, there's a talk later this afternoon I should plug, even though you've already registered, but go to that. Um, it goes through this probably in a lot more detail than I will be. Um, again, different levels of mental health literacy and stigma, um, high risk um, generally with prevalence, and also what really strongly comes through, particularly within higher education, is the cultural incompetency within support provision and how that really needs to improve. Um, women's mental health, so again we've done a literature review just to see what's out there. Um, as Nicola kind of highlighted earlier, um, of all of the groups they're most continuously and consistently declining with their mental health, so there's, there's a significant flag and wanted to focus on this group even more. Um, some factors that we've been able to pull is um, managing various gender roles and societal expectations and the um, questions of caring responsibilities and expectation of having to fulfil caring responsibilities. Um, potentially some challenges with physiology, um, increased risk of being a victim of abuse, discrimination or violence, and also online cultures with body image and self-esteem as well. Um, so a few things to look at that. With first and families, or widening participation or socioeconomic status, or free school meals, or working class students, however you want to group them, um, we weren't entirely sure, that's why I've listed them all. Um, we've done a quite comprehensive literature review, and again we sit on the report, um, generally, there wasn't a lot of literature for this group actually on their mental health specifically. So, when doing literature reviews, we try and overlay looking at 
uh, young people, mental health and that particular group and try and get a sense of what the niche is with students. It's typically quite a gap to, because to focus on all these intersections is, is rare and we want to go on in the future. But with this group, looking at um, uh, working class people's mental health and young working class people's mental health, it was a challenge, it's, it's a serious thing, I think. Um, and yes, the fact is that impact that group's uh, health and alienation and culture self uh, shock, uh, being financially and time poor, experiences of classism, and again, conflicting behaviours. Uh, we're in our second year of the programme of doing work on men's mental health where we're co-producing with some student volunteers to develop interventions that are student-led support um, men. Um, we've got some objectives around improving help seeking, reducing stigma, um, improving their um, health literacy. And some challenges that we can have is on masculinity. Is it, is it an ally or is it an enemy? Um, particularly want to find relationship breakdown as being quite a significant risk factor. Men rely on partners for emotional support more than any other group. Um, so breakdowns in relationships can be a bit of real risk factor for them struggling with their mental health. Um, and generally their mental health literacy is, is um, quite different and has very poor health even behaviours to think it's kind of There's more information about what we're doing there and in two years' time we'll be sharing a lot of other things in that project. And I'm conscious of time so I need to know whiz through this. Um, so we did a piece of work with the chance data. Um, we had over a thousand sponsors talking about all things university experience. We established a baseline and group people into different groups and tried to identify where people differ from baseline according to various themes. Um, with different themes, different people stuck out, but probably most consistently across groups. Um, black, uh, trans and international non EU were pretty consistently standing out from baseline negatively. So across lots of things, having worse experience, so kind of identified more of a need to focus on these groups and potentially more than others more urgently. And ambitions for the future uh, to whiz through. So um, we always want to be working collaboratively with others across the sector, making sure we're co-producing with members of these communities and developing whatever support they feel they need and in understanding the challenges that exist. Making sure we use whatever evidence and research is out there. We have a few, few tools and leaders at our disposal and across the sector to use. So we've recently launched the University Mental Health Charter. Do check that out, that's now on our website. It's a pretty hefty document and there's an entire um, few pages and being dedicated to intersectional student mental health and health inequalities. So uh, do check out that chapter particularly. Um, we've also got a programme working with student unions. So with both of these programmes, we have the opportunity to actually be stretching and identifying what we think best practice is to try and push the sector along to be a group in the practice. The Office of Students is doing a lot of work around EDI and it's one of their priorities and obviously as a body they have regulatory powers so working with them to be pushing them in a way to make sure the sector is improving their work in this space. They're really interested in the mental health aspect too um, and obviously improving how we share and disseminate all of this learning. I'm currently sat on a lot of research and reports and have a lot of stuff in my head how I actually share that with the sector, with you all, to make sure you're doing great work is, is the next step for me, really, in, in making sure that it doesn't just have to be me going on tour and speaking at lightning pace in 20 minutes to get as much information to you as possible. And then just focusing on how we want to do this, um, first and foremost, in tackling and mitigating risk factors, so challenging discrimination, prejudice and bullying, um, the challenges of mental health illiteracy and accessible support and working with the sector to improve the protective factors that we know exist. So having culturally competent support, making sure there are inclusive and accessible student communities, liberation groups, societies, making sure there's a push for working on inclusivity and belonging in HE, and making sure we're generally working to improve mental health literacy across all groups. And that's, that's me, that's time.
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think particularly the working class population um, and looking at mental health. Across all of the populations, there's little to nothing that's been done looking at particularly from that social categorisation experience in HE and mental health altogether. Um, so kind of the work I'm doing with the literature is trying to overlay looking at generally mental health, generally young people, generally this group's experiences and trying to kind of bring that all together. But across all of the groups, nothing on that particularly unique section of the jungle, most of them. Um, with trans students as well, I probably apply for them particularly. Um, as a lot of work is done broadly on LGBTQ populations, but I think within that population, trans students need an additional, um, additional bit of focus with the current context. Thank you. This question is both um, narrowly focused and very similar. I'm interested in where, where um, students are holding multiple identities across the different categories that you're looking at. Um, and how that you are engaging with those, and how maybe what what if at all becomes the dominant identity, or how the institution may um, impose the, the the dominant identity, and then how that then plays itself out in your journey, and how then we as 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 staff and senior leaders manage or, or or engage with that journey and support. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> So I think in my perspective, it's looking at where we had on our conclusion slide about the second point around staff training. And I think where the greatest staff training is, I think there's more awareness and visibility for that particular population. So we, I think what we are doing fairly well is a lot around gender identity and sexual orientation. I think what we can do a lot more on is cultural and ethnicity and race competence and also support for students with disabilities but out, not just in the disability advisory service or for staff in occupational health, but support for staff more broadly. And then working away from, we're good at looking at separate groups rather than, say for me, I identify with someone with disability and LGBTQ+, um, and other obviously characteristics as well, but you wouldn't just look at them separately. They're intertwined and looking at the person holistically. Um, and I think the danger of sometimes completely separating the different areas so that people don't do it holistically. But you need to do that for a starting base, so people have a baseline awareness, and then to integrate it further. So that's the journey that we've just started, and, and it's quite key criteria, as you may know, for quite a few of the charter marks as well. So it's something we really should be doing more on and um, want to do, and to start it to think about how we can do that. Yeah, um, absolutely agree. In all of our research, we'll we do a different demographic monitoring with everything, so we're able to cross compare. So with the LGBTQ population, for example, it was potentially unsurprising that significant different results for international students who have um, potentially non-EU and non-American who come with different levels of stigma attached to that, that identity. Um, so it's something to be mindful of throughout and doing research and understanding the additional unique challenges when there's an increased overlay of different identities, um, and also that comes with increased risk of developing mental health. Probably across all of our research, the dominant identity always comes across as having mental health difficulty or conditions. That's, that's what we focus on, so from my perspective, that's kind of what, what people we speak to first. But in terms of, from a university perspective, managing the with those identities, it's, it's complicated. And um, I suppose giving the steer to students to um, let them kind of identify what their main identities are and what's most significant to them at different points with their student journey. I don't think any, um, any one student is going to say one identity is more prominent than the other statically throughout their entire time. Different things will be come with different challenges and pressures at different points. Hi, um, this question is for Dominique. Um, I really appreciated that on your slide you talked about the importance of data and um, how that's quite important. At the moment, um, as someone with a disability, um, can't complete uh, national student surveys, any of the current quality charters because they're not accessible in Braille, they don't work with accessibility software, so we don't actually have any of this data. And I'm just wondering, in um, the development of the mental health charter, did you make sure that those surveys can be accessible to people like me so that we could contribute to these changes? Yeah, brilliant question. Uh, from the first point in terms of accessibility, um, absolutely, there's so much data that we're missing, and a lot of what we talk about is only the data that we really have unconscious. Um, the process is that we don't do a lot of capturing what we don't have data, and even when we are capturing that, are we doing it accessibly? Mostly not. Um, so there's, there's a lot of data missing, which is a real challenge. Uh, with the charts data, particularly, I, I can't 
Lawrence speaks about, I have been leading on development. My colleague, um, colleagues Lee um, and Gareth have been developing the chapter I'll hear to introduce later to hear more about the methodology later. Um, but they were both just Google form surveys off the top of my head, but we did make sure there were other opportunities for people to be there if they wanted to contribute. But how far and how much they went, um, kind of they engaged and kind of led that stage to make sure they were hearing from different groups, I don't know. But um, yeah, we were open to different ways of people engaging with research. Um, we'll do two more questions. really interesting and to go back to the point I think it's a student quote rather than an under assessment of what students could potentially do or achieve um, but I think that's something also thinking about on a broader scale that we're looking at in terms of community and the diverse community within Reddit um, and also looking at the how many people within different diverse communities or across diverse communities access the university more broadly um, one particular example is that the student body has fairly low numbers of BAME students, whereas Reading as an area has quite a high number of BAME individuals, and looking at addressing that in terms of what the university is doing. With the second part, um, I deliver sexual diversity training to uh, trainee therapists or psychologists, and one key absolute bit, and if you look at Illa Mayer's work, is it's not saying that because you're LGBTQ+, you have a mental health problem. It's looking at, in Illa Mayer's model, saying around societal constructs and prejudice discrimination, um, the various type of homophobia, hypo and transphobia, and that's subsequently affecting the individual, and that potentially leading to risk-taking behaviour, suicidal ideation, self-harm, etc. So that's a key bit that we are very passionate about also. So it's not saying that the two are necessarily intertwined, but looking at societal institutional structure and how that may play a role. So it's moving away from the DSM in the 50s to 70s of you have a problem, well actually is it about prejudice discrimination from society more broadly? I think that's particularly important as why um, making that link in with the services. So within IACT, that's where my clinical practice takes place. So it's important that we share um, as the training goes through the University of Reading, we're delivering that diversity training to the therapists. So we kind of move away from that stereotype or any kind of um, prejudice that may be perhaps pre-existing and widening that education so we can kind of have acceptance and see the diversity that comes through the door um, within the clinic as well. Yeah, brilliant question. Thank you for sharing your experience as well. Um, but the first one, just quickly, I absolutely do agree. And I think universities and student unions have always been in developing those partnerships um, with local communities. And I think there's still that duty of care to the university looking after those populations outside of their own campuses and their own bubbles. Um, and on the second point, absolutely, um, right on and agree with what was just said, I suppose the key bits to highlight the risk factors for developing mental health isn't being LGBTQ, it's because you're experiencing discrimination, having to manage your identity in a system where there's a lot of assumptions about what your identity is and there's lots of norms. So I suppose it's making sure we keep um, a focus on the narrative being about what the risk factors to this population experiencing it. 
Um, just I suppose as a bit of a positive highlight, a lot of literature at the moment is kind of um, demonstrating the positive impact on mental health on legislation and social attitudes change. So I read something fairly recently about um, decreasing the suicidality of LGBTQ populations in countries after they legalising the marriage. And the trend is there in the social attitudes improving, it has a positive impact on mental health. So it's reframing it not as the identities to blame, it's, it's the wider societal context that needs to be focused on.